Hello everyone and welcome to Crusader Kings 3. I'm Lord Formand, here with a guide with some basic tips and tricks of stuff that you guys need to know to play Crusader Kings 3 better. So, first off, the some of the things that come from Crusader Kings 2 carry over into Crusader Kings 3. The biggest one, which most people neglect to realize, is that your levies in your capital are boosted, which means you should develop your capital as much as you can. And when it comes time to develop other stuff, you want to develop other stuff in your capital duchy. In this case, I'm playing as, or I'm showing you guys, my Empire of Mali that I've created, which includes actually a fair amount of these. Um, so, focus as much of your building you can in your capital um, duchy. Specifically your capital, then your capital duchy. Also, you have four building slots available for normal buildings in your capital. It looks like you have six, but that's not true. These are a duchy, and this is a special building. So be aware, you only have four choices here, and some of them are better than others. Obviously, you're probably going to want to build a mud brick tower, or in this case, it's mud brick, but basically you want to build something that gives you a fort and a garrison. I would recommend building, if you want money, crop fields are going to be your best bet. They give you the most money or whatever the equivalent is. Um, you've got other stuff like, in this case, the hound pens, the hunting grounds. At max level gives you half decent taxes, um, but the big stuff it also does is it provides levies and a defense advantage. Homesteads are actually, I find, pretty worthwhile building. They give a good supply limit, garrison rate. The big thing is they do a levy reinforcement rate while providing both a levy and a tax base. So um, there are other choices, obviously. Um, if you want just pure levies and stuff, barracks are great, as are military camps. Um, this is, I don't know if this applies in some other countries, but you have this like plantation building. Looking it over, I don't see it being worth that much other than maybe for the development growth. The taxes aren't great. The holding taxes are nice, but it doesn't provide any troops. So try and focus on ones that either give you lots of tax or ones that give you um, tax and levies, or just pure levies if you're looking at the issue. But some of them are better than others, so by all means, go into it and click your way up it to find what provides you what you needed. Another thing most people forget is that your castle here, or whatever your, if you start as a tribal, it's, you can upgrade it as well. Basically, it's your fort building in the actual capital. Um, you can actually upgrade it, and it's worth doing because it provides pretty good levies, tax, and a garrison. It's expensive, um, but it's pretty good. And obviously, you can build other... If you've got a capital duchy that only has like a tribe in it, if you start as a tribal leader, which I did, um, you can't initially build holdings here. And when you do, you have to build a... Uh, temple, shrine, equivalent one, and a city before you can build anything else. But then you can build more castles. Building the castles in your capital duchy is worth it if you want troops. If you want more gold, you want to build um, cities. And if you want a mix of both, you're going to want to build the temple. I find that the temples don't really contribute that much. Um, it basically has the same bonuses as your uh, castle. Um, it just provides more levies than a city does. Whereas I found the city, if you just invest in the gold, ends up giving you a fair amount of income anyway. Um, plus you can upgrade the city itself, which is worth doing because it provides a very large garrison. Not as worth doing in the temple, but that's one thing. Uh, next things. So how do we afford these buildings? Most people, most people are still a little confused on the whole lifestyle stuff. So first off, Stress is here, lifestyle is here. You want to pick a lifestyle that helps. Some help more than others. From what I can tell from having played, there are certain categories in each tree that are less useful or focused on certain areas. So, for example, under the diplomacy C, we've got, we've got three different trees, a diplomat, august, and family hierarch, or hierarch. Uh, so these one, this one's all about focusing on your family, which is good. This one's all about just ruling. It's pretty useful. Um, this one really right here, true ruler plus vassalization acceptance, 25. This is amazing if you're trying to unite a region. Um, my king that united 
the Malian Empire went grabbed it, and I was able to vassalize lots of people around me. Um, also because of the religion, but that's that's for later. And then there's other than your military tree. You've got stuff like this. By and large, from what I found, the left tree in each um, lifestyle focus is the least useful. It's just my style of play. Although the only exception is the intrigue. If you don't want to become like you know high amounts of dread or do seduction, it's not bad. But you have to really want to play the intrigue game. Which these twice schemes, max hostile schemes plus one, really useful. Really useful. But which of these are the most useful? Kind of depends on your situation. But I'll go over the one I found the most useful and then I'll follow it up with the next two. So the one I found the most useful, bar none, was the scholar tree under learning. So under learning, you got choices. I would actually take the scholarship focus here because it gives you the most learning. And then the first one you want to take is scientific, especially if you're your cultural head, which my ruler is, because this will boost your fascination progress by a lot. This tree right here is basically how you're going to get um, tech, and tech is still king in Crusader King schemes. And obviously tech is very different, um, but the addition of the fascination towards it allows significant boost towards learning um, innovations and if you're a tribal ruler like my guy started out you want to sit on um the learning tree as much as you can or the scholar tree as much as you can you want to try and get as much learning as possible because the only way to get out of being a tribal vassal is a uh, tribal ruler is to totally get all the innovations for the tribal era and get high Tribal authority and getting high tribal authority isn't as hard as getting the tech. So, also tip for getting high tribal authority and reforming it: don't go to the highest level of tribal authority until you're actually able to reform. Otherwise, um, mainly because that negative thirty opinion will make all your tribal vassals want to revolt on you. I made that mistake in this game; got really rough. Um, so the next useful trait especially if you're trying to reform a religion is theologian over here specifically this one the prophet faith creation and reformation cost minus 50. so if you want to make your own faith or you have an unreformed religion like i did uh, you need profit it discounted my cost of reforming the religion from 5600 piety down to obviously um 2800 i think that, that's just huge. Plus, this will give you the piety you need. If you're going to go down this and trying to reform it, make sure you take the theology. That plus one piety a month is really good. In terms of making money, because this is something a lot of people have struggled with in all Paradox games, let alone Crusader Kings 3. The way to make money I have found so far is to take the wealth focus, obviously, for monthly income. And then do this one, Avaricious, Golden Obligations, Demand Payment for Hooks. How do you get hooks? It's tricky, but when I, what I find as the ruler of an empire, I get like one to two minor hooks a year, and the obligation is like 50 to 60 gold each time, which is... I've Just in the last like five years in game, I've probably made almost a thousand gold off hooks without trying to do anything. After that, um, this if you're going to use your steward to collect taxes, you want to grab taxmen. And if you're having trouble construction, cutting cornerstone, cutting cornerstones for the gold cost constructions, just a little light, nice little bonus. But otherwise, if you're always at war, war profiteer plus ten income and plus ten vassal contribution are really good. Uh, you can exhort money from your subjects, but it tends to cause unhappiness, which makes sense um and if you've got a lot of republican vassals this is really good and as you, obviously as you move down you get you know sell titles and other stuff but i found just golden obligations alone payment for the hooks was really solid if you're fighting wars now this one this one is if you're like going to be commanding your uh armies 
and you're fighting people who are equal in strength to you. But so far, I found most Crusader Kings three wars are lopsided. One side is significantly stronger. So I haven't actually found a great use for this tree. Um, it's pretty good. If you're going to do it, you want to snag strategy focus. Or if you're going to be fighting battles yourself, you want to do chivalry focus. This plus five um, advantage and the plus three prowess is really good. But the one I found the most use out of was serve the crown. So first off, gives you dread. That, that, it's a small amount of dread, so it's not a huge issue. It tends to intimidate people more than cause problems. Plus if you're like gregarious or compassionate, it doesn't even matter. So it's pretty good. It's the plus 0.3 control growth that's really solid. It will help rein in your entries in your realm from causing revolts. Pretty good. Um, strike organization is also really good. Increase the control if you use your marshal for that, which you should. Um, this one right here, hard rule, is the big bonus. Faction military power threshold for vassals plus 20. This means the vassals, if they form a faction revolt against you, have to have more troops than they would otherwise. Really useful, especially if you're going to go um, dark and build a lot of dread by going like down the torturer tree later on or before it. It's really good. Um, this basically tree, just to summarize it, is basically for people who are struggling to maintain control over their realms. But I found it's pretty good overall. You get a defender advantage here with the man's home during hardships. This one's really good. Fort level, but more importantly, enemy occupations don't lower control. So if you're in an area that's getting raided a lot by tribal people, this will prevent you from having to constantly have your marshal in your lands improving control. Plus it stacks with some of the other control progress. But the big one here is friendly territory levy reinforcement rate and army maintenance. This, if you're fighting defensive wars, this tree cannot be understated to be crazy strong. Especially once you get down here to stuff like Overseer. Control growth factor plus 20, you get Marshal and Stewardship. You get a lot of pretty nice bonuses. And you got Absolute Control. If you get Control at 100, you get Absolute and give additional bonus to tax and levies. If you get a small realm or you got a large realm you're having trouble protecting or holding on to, this is the way to go. If you're trying to do uh, seduction and stuff, obviously you do the seduction tree. I haven't found an overwhelming great use for the diplomacy tree. Um, there are some like fellow vassal opinion stuff. This one I probably would take if I was a vassal. Um, there's a couple of them you might want to take if you're a vassal. Um, where is that? Oh, I can't remember offhand. There was there was some stuff that was pretty useful in one of the other trees. But basically, scholar, theologian, if you need to reform a religion, um, avaricious and architect here to gain the money, and then basically you could just go down overseer with every character and it would always be worth it. But anyway, that's lifestyle. So in terms of religion, um, religion, you should be able to figure this out, but basically you have to own... Three holy sites and have an absolute way too high level of piety. I think they'll have to lower it. It's rather high. Um, but then when you're creating your faith, the closer you stay to your original faith, the cheaper it is to reform it. So I wouldn't change much. So for those of you who um, know what the um, faith I was playing as, the um, Bagad, I think it's Bagadu, Bidak, Bidak faith. Uh, you'll know it has, starting out, it starts out with cannibalism. Um, so obviously I have changed that. Um, I changed it to carnal exaltation, which is not much better. Uh, I wanted the fertility for my rulers. But even stuff like changing these um, becomes expensive. Do remember, though, once you change it, you can't change it again. Um, you have to create an entirely separate religion. However... If you have an unreformed faith, basically any reformed faith is better than an unreformed faith. For gameplay purposes, you can always spend uh, another ruler later on reforming the faith the way you want and then having to convert everything again. Um, but any reformed faith is better than unreformed um, because you need it to uh, become futile. Obviously, not a thing here. Okay.
in terms of how to use your court. Now, most people using your, sorry, your counsel is something that a lot of people are going to miss. So you've got your spouse. And the spouse is really awesome. I really like what they've done with that. So you can do general where you get a boost to all your stats. It's worth looking at because sometimes the boost, like my guy is getting, what, 10 total bonuses just from that. But if you need, if your ruler's weak in one area, like I had a king who had zero martial skill, but when I had his wife focus on chivalry, I got plus seven and that saved my kingdom. Um, if you're going to do tech, do uh, learning because stacking learning to become really good. It, it, it's basically you're going to get the tech faster based off the learning of whoever's your culture head, which should be you once you get good at the game. So it's worth getting that as high as possible. Uh, in terms of your most important person on your council, I have found the most important person on the council is your chancellor. Arguably. Spy master might be the other, because if you have a bad spy master, you're going to get yourself killed. But no, I found the chancellor is the best person on the council for one simple reason. Domestic affairs. Direct vassal opinion plus 11. It increases to 11. This will stop so many revolts. This... External foreign affairs, it's nice if you're wanting to be, you know, friends with people around you. But I have found this to be the best thing for a large empire. I cannot tell you how much this plus 11 stops revolts. It goes up based off their diplomacy skill. This one's 22, so it's half. Obviously, it's lower. But trying to put a good counselor in office just to leave this on would be really handy. Plus, you can get other events like improve your feudal con on track. Increase vassal opinion. There's not a lot of terrible side effects on that. Um, the next important one's probably your priest or whatever. Um, if you're trying to reform a religion, leave it on religious relations the whole time. That plus piety, you need it. Um, I found the hardest thing in the game to be getting enough piety. It might be different for faiths that could do a lot of holy wars, um, but in terms of a faith that I didn't use holy wars for, it was hard getting the prestige. Next, converting the faith and fabricating the claims make this one probably your second most important one. But the one I really wanted to provide you with tips with is the steward here. So the steward looks relatively basic on paper, right? Increase taxes, increase development, or promote culture. And it ticks up over time. Unless you need the money, you should always have your steward on increasing development and put it in your capital. It's a long, drawn-out process, increasing development growth. I forget. I don't remember what I started at for development down here in Africa, but my development is 20. And why does that matter? Well, if we go all the way up to Paris, Paris's development is 19. I've actually made my capital more developed than Paris. And if we go over here towards where Rome is, Rome is 30 seven development so it's still much more developed than i am but the key point is i'm getting there see another 32 here but if we move to somewhere out here i gotta say i don't like this zoom in issue um we go come on game we got here you'll see the development is lower than my capital development has really good bonuses and you want to get it as high as possible as soon as possible Unless you need the money, especially if you're a tribal ruler where money is not as big issue, leave it on increased development. It's you additional when you're feudal. It gives you levies, taxes, and supply limit, which is really nice. If you can see the difference here, this is 7.5. This is 10. So it's half your development is the bonus. So if you can get it to 100, that's a plus 50 bonus. It, it adds up over a while. Um, obviously try and keep your control as high as possible to make sure that you get don't lose any bonuses. Um, outside of that, how else to use your council? Well, your spy master should always be on disrupt schemes unless you're using it to help get a scheme done or you're trying to get a hook or a secret on somebody. If you've got a too strong vassal who's causing you problems, like I've had one of the guys down here um, assigning your spy master to work on this guy's um, 
basically find out if he's got any dirty secrets so I can blackmail him. I've managed to keep him under control, mainly just using hooks and secrets, which is pretty useful. Um, more importantly, if you can sometimes get hooks, which then if you have that gold trait, you can then blackmail them for gold. Your marshal, um, although very, very useful, um, I don't find it as useful as your chancellor or priest, but he should always be on organized levies because he boosts your levies and your garrison size, which means your overall army is larger because of it. Um, I haven't found a great use for training commanders. Maybe if you've got a massive army and you just want better commanders or knights, putting that on there could be good. But control, if you conquer new land, you should put him in there. So blue here means the 100% control. Green is less, and then it goes down to red. If you own any of a province that's red, like personally own it, not your vassal, you should probably put your marshal into controlling it. Um, and then if you've got nothing else for them to do and you're not fighting, you could help your vassals. But why would you help your vassals? It's Crusader Kings. Your vassals are by and large your worst enemies. <laughs> so there's that. Uh, other things to realize. You have your succession laws for your government. And by the way, going up these authorities is really useful. But once you start getting to the high level ones, losing that negative 30 opinion it's really painful um so you can do what you can do under this is you can change your succession laws obviously the biggest goal is you want to either get to primogeniture or ultimogeniture basically you want to get to one of these single hair laws um but in order to do that you have to have high crown authority and you have to get innovations um which take a while to get but you want to get away from confederate partition as soon as you can um, if you're a tribal ruler and you've got a kingdom and you die, your realm will by and large be split. And if you've got the ability to create another kingdom, they will get a kingdom as well. I had to conquer the I had to conquer the kingdom of Mali Gen a, like three or four times before I managed to form an empire. Luckily, once you're an empire, when your ruler dies, your heir keeps the empire. It doesn't split empires, but it does for kingdoms. Of course, you lose your land within it, but you want to try and slowly move your way towards um, high partition if you're stuck, um, unable to get to primogeniture, which you will be for some time. This at least gives the lion shares to your heir, so upon death, your heir is less likely to be overthrown by their siblings, which is useful. Uh, you can also do gender laws, but that sometimes depends on your religion. Like, I can't do women because I wasn't able to reform my religion to allow um, women to rule, basically. Uh, if you can change your heir, you can do that. But that's one page. You can also get to here. So if I go to my title, capital title, by the way, this is all the Empire of Mali is supposed to be, so I'm much larger. Down here, you've got your line of succession, right? You can add laws. Now, this, this is really cool, um, especially if you have a, this, the needed cultures. Um, like, I'm not Gaelic or Brythonic, so I can't do tanistry. But if you can, some of these for tanistry is really good. And obviously, basically all of these... Um, not entirely these ones aren't as great as Tanistry because you can swap dynasties but um, stuff like feudal elector um, as long as you can control people uh, close family is a good one it's also if you just want to do a law like this add a law um, but you have to have high crown authority for some of it or if you want to change into elective you can do it that way I just find it very weird that you can't change the succession laws from this page. So just remember there's two places where you can mess around with succession stuff. It's kind of interesting. Let's see. I'm trying to think of what else you guys need to know offhand. Oh yes, your military. You should always try and have as many champions or knights as you can get. This basically have them as much as you can um, one thing to go through to do is to make sure you don't have um one of your heirs or something like your sole genius heir 
being a champion and fighting in your armies, by all means, forbid them from joining armies as champions. But if you really want to mess someone up, like you've got a you've got someone who wants to take your throne. So like this guy right here is a son and he's going to inherit one of my two counties. So I could force him to join the armies and the odds of him dying go up considerably. Um, so I can try and kill off heirs or brothers or unhappy cousins using this. This I found is actually better to do than murder because it doesn't count as murder. Uh, men at arms regiments, you should always really have some. They're going to be what makes your army strong. Um, basically, you want to support as much men at arms as you can without, your, without destroying your economy. As you can see, I'm losing five gold a month. I've had to disband my men at arms down from what I had as a tribal nation just because um, once they swap from prestige to costing gold, I was losing money like crazy. So as you can see, the Sahal Horseman is a unique for my culture. Um, it's really quite good for countering archers and heavy infantry, which a lot of these areas do. But other of these, you want to look through and make sure you know what they counter. Like these ones counter heavy infantry, bowmen counter skirmishers, etc. etc. Lies the horsemen counters archers. You can see why I'm using these guys because they counter archers and heavy infantry. But stuff like pikemen counter cavalry, which is good, footmen counter spearmen, etc. etc. These ones help um, with siege. So if you're going to be sieging a lot of stuff, by all means, use an oninger. Um, just be aware they cost money both raised and unraised. You can get away with sitting in the sweet spot between unraised and full maintenance. But then once you raise them, you better have a big war chest. Part of the reason my ruler here is on the throne, I think he took the throne at... Um, does it tell me when he took the throne? Uh, probably not offhand. He took the throne at the age of eight. Um, as you can imagine, there was a lot of problems. He got overthrown because I was still a tribal one. I think this is the guy I reformed with. Might have been his father. Yeah, it was his father. His father um, died at 25, actually. Uh, this guy got overthrown and had to fight his way back into power. I'm trying to remember which one I actually did the empire with. Oh, I can't remember. One of them got overthrown while I still had the empire, but I was still feudal, uh, tribal. Uh, but because I had 4,000 gold, I used the mercs and retook my throne. So basically, you really want to save... Hmm. <sighs> Probably about 400 gold if you're a small ruler, enough to be able to hire a company for three years. Um, right now, obviously, I'm struggling a bit, but if I had 300 gold, I could hire another fourth of my army. So that is very worth doing. Um, the other thing to realize is if you go under your um, vassals and you do all, you can f roughly figure out. Um, who is your largest and most dangerous vassals? You do have a vassal limit, which is kind of hidden down there. Um, this is also where you can tell how your vassal's default opinion is. But if you look through here, you can roughly see how large a uh, vassal is. Not as easy as in Crusader Kings 2, but as I can see, this guy has a 10 size, whereas this one is 3. So obviously... I've got to keep an eye on this guy. He's on my council mainly because leaving him off of it was a real risk. Whereas this guy here with four is not as there, but he counts as a powerful vassal. So check this screen if you're trying to, if you're having any issues at all containing your vassals. Because it's going to be really useful to figure out who's large, where their power base is, and more importantly, what their stats are. Um, I found I've used this page a lot more than I expected I would. Uh, I haven't really used the court page. Uh, hooks. This will tell you what hooks you might have. Um, if you know these secrets, you can blackmail them from a hook, and then once you have the hook, you can demand money or you can get a favor for them. Um, factions. I like the faction tree here because you can roughly see what the people's and opinions are. So if I want to get rid of this guy, I can bribe him, get his opinion up, and hopefully he'll leave the faction. But the most important scheme I've ever come across so far is the sway scheme. Basically, it will if successful, and it's usually successful if you have any diplomacy at all. 
you can improve the relations with people. So this guy's in a faction, but if I got him up by 25%, uh, 25 points, which is quite possible, he'd almost definitely leave it. And just by starting this scheme, it starts this whole, um, uh, basically under here, I've got this, it says about 10 months, and then it'll keep going. It's really useful. By all means, if you have a super powerful vassal, which this guy has been, um, I think he likes me because I bribed him? No, he just likes me because I've got a long reign now. Um, this guy has caused a lot of trouble for me because he's of a different faith than me. Um, I really need to, to get him to convert, but he won't right now. Um, swaying this guy has kept him under control over the years, or maybe it was his father, but... Plus 25, don't underestimate that, especially when you stack it with the bonus from Chancellor. You can get like 30, 40 opinion from a vassal just by using uh, schemes and stuff and your base diplomacy, which is why if you have to pick a lifestyle perk for diplomacy and you're struggling it, foreign affairs focus is really good just to keep um, the diplomacy, get the highest bonus. Prestige is nice. If you're a tribal ruler, you may need it. And obviously, if you're trying to build a large dynasty, fertility is really good. But as you can see um, from here, I've got 228 living members less than 200 years after the game starts. So not a real issue. In terms of um, your legacies. Now, you can do whichever legacy you want. If you want to play Dread, you go down Guile, basically. If you're all about Intrigue, it's pretty good. I have found so far, and I've done two games, I've unlocked all of one of these trees in a different game. I found the law to be one of the best ones. It, it sounds strange, and some people will dispute it, but I have found law to be really good because of this one, mostly fair. Popular opinion plus five. If there's nothing else you pick in this tree, mostly fair is probably the best one. It's just a base five increase with everybody helps a lot containing revolts revolts honestly are or instability within your realm is your worst problem you want to have a stable realm so then you can fight people and then have to deal with their problems i found stability to be really good um this one right here control growth if you have this and you stack it with the um overseer tree under the martial lifestyle perk you can get like 0.5 control growth a month between those two you should have no um revolt risk this one, by the way, applies in all of them, except for blood. It's basically, um, oh, and kin. It's basically just plus 10 lifestyle experience. So if you know you're going to spend a lot of time with your family doing a specific tree, like I am going to go down intrigue and seduction for the entire game, uh, it would help you to do guile. Um, if you're trying to build, get ahead in tech, doing stuff like uh, erudition would be really useful. Um, if you do warfare, which... A lot of you are going to squire is pretty good but the other one that i found to be really good was this delegate authority powerful vassals plus five opinion since i'm really an empire i have issues with vassals kind of a given especially because i subdued them rather than created them this one but combined with this another plus 10 so a lot of my strong vassals will be pretty loyal the ending ones for a lot of these are relatively disappointing <laughs> If you go down glory, you'll get a general opinion plus 10, which is stronger than this, but it takes a whole tree to go down. Um, this one's short rain duration is really good, though. So this is a very strong tree glory. Kin, if you're trying to get your dynasty really good, um, it, or you have a lot of uh, related, related kin ruling in your kingdom, which I do, uh, this is really good for the dynasty opinion and the better traits. The danger is this gives all your dynasty members better traits, including some that may be a rival for you. So I've been avoiding it. Um, this one right here, House of Warriors, Prowess plus 2, Knight Effectivist plus 15, is really good. Basically, almost all of the default tree stuff is really strong. Um, to the point that it's almost worth unlocking all of these before you go deep into one. Or... See, because these are 1,000 on the left, and these ones on the right are 5,000, so you can almost unlock all level 1 before you unlock the final one. Um, that's pretty good. Uh, if you're doing a lot of warfare, this, this plus men-at-arms and house guards, really strong. 
really strong. This one for Tyranny, really strong. This one, if you want to do the inbreeding stuff, Resilient Bloodline here, chance of inheriting bad traits, negative 30, chance of new bad traits, negative 30. Combined with these ones here, chance of good and reinforcing. If you want to have the perfect person who's, you know, a genius, beautiful, robust, every, everything you'd want in a good ruler, uh, this will be the way to do it. Especially once you can pick one to become more common. And life expectancy is a really nice tip. This one is a bit more learning. So if you're having trouble um, getting piety to reform your religion, this is another way to do it. But I don't know if I'd want to waste two levels to get that much. Basically, look over these, figure out what you're going to do, and in the future, plan towards it. There are some that are really good overall, like opinion, uh, prowess, uh, good traits, which is good. Um, there are so figure out what you want to do and go for the legacies. I found getting renowned isn't as actually as hard as they made it out to be at start. Uh, the other thing is up here you have this issues. You notice I keep accidentally clicking towards it. It's because it's a good habit to get into. This basically tells you what's going on in your lands. Um, it's really useful, especially can imprison cr criminals, can create titles. You notice I've got a lot of kingdoms I can create. I'm avoiding that because right now it's all getting distributed amongst the children of my ruler, and I kind of don't want to do it until I've got a one succession one. As it is, I've got already like five kingdoms in my lands. Uh, but this will tell you if you can blackmail people for hooks and if you can change the feudal contract. So we'll jump into a feudal contract here. Modify feudal contract. Obviously, this only starts once you're feudal, not tribal. Um, but basically, this is how, what's your relationship with your vassal. And you'd see, like, right here, no opinion effects. But if we go up to here, there's negative 15. So this is an act of tyranny. However, if you have a hook, which I don't at the moment, you can freely change, which is really cool. Um, some of these require, uh, you have to can only go adjacent, so you can only go one level at a time. I will point out, trying to modify multiple things at once does not work. Um, with one hook, you have to do it per each hook. You can make one change. If you're having trouble keeping people happy, um, council rights here, guaranteed, giving them plus five with a vassal. It, it it really does help. Um, basically, they have to be on your council, which can be problematic if they're not good. But if you're struggling to keep someone happy, that can be good. You can always get rid of it later. Uh, this one allows people to declare war within the realm. This would almost be worth giving to like an heir that you want to build up to have your heir conquer land within your realm. So then you can inherit it once you swap rulers. And that just makes them pay less to expand. This one is really nasty. Force partition. I've actually done it to this vassal down here, which is why he's smaller. He used to own all of this. Uh, force partition basically means they have to stay at partition and um, divide their land upon succession. So if you've got a super powerful vassal, this is the way to break them down. Obviously, it's less of an issue when everybody in my realm has partition. Um but it would be much more useful up in Europe or something. This one protects them from revoking. I would really not use this that much because then you can't get rid of their title. And for strong vassals, being able to revoke their titles if they revolt on you or in a scheme or you lock them up is really good. This one gets really interesting. Special con uh, contract. You can do some pretty powerful stuff. This one gives them extra prestige and stuff. And you get extra prestige as well, but they pay less. March is pretty cool. Basically, they pay less in tax, but they have more defense. And more importantly, they provide you with a bigger levy. And maintaining the army for them is cheaper. So if you're going to have like a front where you're going to do a lot of fighting, like maybe the Byzantines on the Abbasid Caliphate border, that would be pretty useful there um, A March. Scuttage basically just means they pay more in taxes and they provide less levies. It's uh, all of these are worth customizing. Um, by and large, as a ruler, usually you want more gold than troops from your uh, feudal lords, unless you're worried about them revolting, in which case, getting more troops from them will keep their revolt level down. 
Um, but early on getting gold is good, which is why several of my vassals, I've tweaked the contract contracts towards giving me more money. Okay, so last thing I think to cover. So as you can see, we have I have all these penalties for these guys. But when it comes to educating a child, I have found if I found education to be much more important in this game than in Crusader Kings 2. Basically, you want to have a much better educator. Thankfully, you have an option for them to convert culture or to convert religion upon education, uh, if it's not you. Most of the time, you're going to probably want to educate your own children yourself so that you can control their traits. But if you've got like a genius, um, genius wife or something like this one is a really good wife so i've had her educate a couple children uh she provides much better bonus yeah so uh and more importantly if you want to swap religions this is the way to do it um at one point i had an i can change the religion and then i had an old bidic ruler take over but because i married a spouse and then did to her religion i was able to but then the issue was the child was of a different religion i just had her educate the child and uh, i managed to convert the religion that way so i will conclude this video with one last thing to say it's more of a conceptual thing remember crusader kings takes place over a long period of time nothing happens immediately barring warfare or um Basically, barring warfare or executions, everything takes place over time, including revolts, including being imprisoned, including building up a dynasty, which is part of the reason I told you guys to focus on technology, because this takes a long time. So don't worry if you can't do much with a single generation of rulers. It takes multiple generations to build an empire. Um, as you can see, there's been quite a few rulers in my person's family here. Um, actually, I didn't play as this guy. This is the first guy I played as, I believe. And as you can see, slowly we moved through the history before becoming an empire. For a long time, especially now, I've just been sitting here trying to build up my power, tweak the feudal contracts, and get tech. Uh, I spent, must have been 80 or so years stuck in the tribal era, unable to go at all. Thankfully, I didn't need this cultural regional stuff, but getting all of these takes time. Getting all of these takes a long time, and obviously getting all of these takes even longer. Obviously, you have a bonus if you're in Central Europe where it's more, or and uh, the Middle East where it's more educated than the outskirts. But as you can see, you can form quite a powerful little empire on the outskirts. Let's see, what's a good example? This guy here. In France, that's a pretty big France. It's got roughly the same amount of troops I do. Obviously, he'd win a war because he's got better technology, but kind of gives you a, a sense of this guy's a tribal kingdom. I'm a feudal kingdom kingdom now, and we have equivalent stuff. The other thing is allies. I find matter immensely in this. You really want to keep an eye on your allies and your enemies' allies. So it doesn't it doesn't get built in a day an empire rome was not built in a day nor was the malian empire and just expand remote control convert and keep your vassals happy if you can keep your vassals happy half the difficulty of the game is gone and then the only threat is from outside so a lot of empires collapse under their own weights oddly enough the byzantines haven't but the abbasids have been or the Arabians now have been having a lot of trouble with their vassals. So anyway, that will be it for this video. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Hopefully it will help you. If it did, please like, subscribe, comment, you know, the standard stuff. And uh, let me know if you need any more detailed guides on stuff. Uh, I answer most questions on my channel. So if you have one, I'll probably get back to you. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.